My name's Alex and I've been a beekeeper since the summer of 2021. I'm a bit nervous. I'm not gonna lie, I am scared. Oh my God, look at that. And over the past few years, I've realized that bees are incredible animals. And this year I've challenged myself to another year of beekeeping with the aim to harvest honey and wax at the end of this summer. Last year I managed to harvest 12.5 kilograms of honey. So that is the number we need to beat. Today is gonna to be the last day of the year where I'm going to look inside my beehive and have an inspection and see how the bees are getting on. But there's one main reason I need to look inside the beehive today, and that is because there is something called a Varroa destructor mite, which parasites on honeybees. Now, originally, the Varroa destructor mite was only present on the eastern honeybee, which is another species of honeybee. Apis, what's the Latin? Apis serrana. But when the Varroa mite came in contact with the western honeybee, the western honeybee wasn't ready for it. It hadn't evolved with the Varroa mite, so it caused a lot more damage. And I've heard that as a beekeeper, you should really do something about it. Now, it's a little bit controversial because some beekeepers say, don't treat your bees, let the bees adapt, become more immune to the Varroa mite. Other beekeepers say, you must treat them, you must kill all the mites and, and get rid of them. As a new beekeeper, it can be very confusing, you know, co contradicting information. Like, what, what do you do when you don't actually know much about it yourself? And I mean, I looked inside my hive the other day. I did a mite check, which is basically putting a board underneath the hive, letting mites drop from the bees onto this board. You take the board out and then you look and then you see how many mites there are present. There are quite a few of them. Like quite a few were dropping down each day. And even on the back of the bees, I could see these little brown mites like attached to the back where they are. I think they suck the blood of the bees and slowly kill them and make them weak. I've heard that the Varroa mite doesn't actually always kill the bee, but it can weaken the bee, which leads to secondary like infections and diseases. So I want to treat my bees with something to, uh, to kill them off. So we're gonna head into the garden, open up the hives and do some treatment and kill the Varroa destructor mites. Gosh, am I a bad human for killing mites? I don't know, I want my bees to survive. I want them to be healthy. And I think if you were, any other farmer or if you if your pet dog or cat had a illness you'd want to treat it you know you, you love your pets and my 20 or so thousand bees out there are all my pets so i want to give them a helping hand let's go let's treat the bees after beekeeping for a year i've resorted to using a blow torch to light my smoker because it's a lot quicker and easier <sighs> Oh, hey! One of my favourite parts of beekeeping is using the smoker. It's just a lot of fun, blowing smoke. Now things are getting serious. I've got this treatment called Apivar, which is um, made by a company called Veto Pharma, made in France. Uh, it is a dedicated apiculture product, so it's uh, for beekeeping and treating varroa mites. It says here, the active ingredient is amitraz, which is a sublethal miticide, which I, I believe sublethal means that it doesn't directly kill the mites, it paralyzes them, and then they starve to death. Pretty brutal, but I hope that it, um, it does the job. Apivar, it comes in strips. I heard that most colonies in the winter, they die because of becoming weak due to large infestations of varroa mites. So that is why I really want to treat these mites because I don't want my bees to die. Because if they die, then I have to get new bees next year and start the whole process again. Now my bees have been rather angry recently. I think at this time of year, they're really on guard. They don't want anyone going into their hives. Um, I got stung on my finger the other day. It was really painful, but hopefully they're going to be nice today. Oh, wow. Now that's a good sight. Every, that is solid honey. Like, solid. There's nothing but honey on that frame. And the other side as well. Oh my goodness. 
that's a really good sign because bees need, I think, 30, 40 pounds of honey to survive a winter. Like, that's a rough estimate. But yeah, that is really good news. And that frame as well, solid. That's really dark colored, that stuff. Check out that. It's just wall to wall, solid honey. There's my queen. Spot the queen. It's pretty easy because it's got a dot on its head. Stung. Only just got me though. Ow. That's painful. Yeah, these gloves, these gloves, what, what? They're pointless. There's so many bees. That is crazy how healthy this hive looks. These strips contain the amateurs. So apparently the way these strips work is you want the mite to come in contact with the strip. So you put this in, the bees have the mite on their back, they brush alongside this, and then the mite gets paralyzed. So I want this to be in the busiest area of the hive. I've got two of them. You're gonna put two in for a full-sized hive like this but I want them mostly around the brood area because if it gets cold, they will all go towards the brood area and the brood area is around here. And hopefully that kills a lot of the mites and I have a nice healthy hive going into next year. So that's the last inspection of the year. I will have to go inside the hives in between six and 10 weeks time to take out those treatment strips because you're not going to leave them in too long because you don't want the mites to become resistant to the amitraz chemical inside the treatment. So I have to take them out, but other than that, I'm just going to leave them and fingers crossed they survive till next spring. I'm actually quite worried that my bees aren't going to make it this winter because it has been so, so wet. And I've heard that the cold doesn't really affect bees too much, like they can deal with it. There's bees living far north in Scandinavia and Alaska. Uh, they can deal with very cold temperatures, but it's the dampness and the wetness of their hive which can really cause them to fail over winter. And it has just been raining constantly for the last like two weeks. And I checked inside one of my hives the other day and the whole of the inside of the lid was wet. So I replaced the roof on one of the hives to um, hopefully make it waterproof again. There's not really much else I can do. I can't stop the rain. I can't change the weather. So we're just gonna have to hope that it dries up. It's a pretty bleak December day and I'm going to check on my bees. I've got to remove the treatment that I put in about eight or nine weeks ago for the Varroa mites. And also I need to check the weight of the hives to see if they've got enough food because currently there's not many flowers about so I need to feed them if they get low on their stores. Oh, and I got some new beekeeping attire. These are my shoes. They are now my gardening and beekeeping shoes. They're like slip on shoes. They're made of wood and leather. They're not exactly gonna stop the bees from stinging me but I think they're really nice. Using the smoker is so much fun. I'm coming in, bees, but as quick as I can. These were the Varroa mite strips. Hopefully they did the trick. The way we will know if they did the trick is by putting in some boards underneath the hive. I'm gonna leave them there for about a week, pull them out, and if there's no mites, then the job has been done well. Strip one out. Strip number two. Calm it, calm it, calm it. All right, we'll go back inside, go back, go back to bed. My poor bees, looks like they're not doing too well, but it is very natural, I believe, to see dead bees at the front of the hive in winter. 
because the colonies shrink from like 60,000 bees to, I don't know, 20,000 or uh, a lot less basically. After lifting this hive, I've realized that they do have quite a lot of stores in there. They probably have enough for now. But I want to do a test and see if bees take down this fondant sugar, which is a year old. So fondant icing is what bakers use, like it's icing sugar. But it's uh, a good feed for bees in the winter. Last year when I fed it, it was soft and the bees took it down very quickly. But it has now gone almost rock solid. And I'm not sure whether the bees will try and eat it still or not. So I'm gonna find out by doing a little experiment. So this is a feeder which was being used for sugar syrup. I'm gonna go on top like that. There's some bees in, this, in the bottom of this feeder. This feeder is for liquid sugar syrup. So the sugar syrup goes in and they eat it out. But in the winter, they don't take down liquid food when it's cold. So you need to feed them with fondant, which is a solid sugar. And I just get the lid and put it on top. This hive is a lot lighter than that one, which means they've got a lot less food inside here, which means they definitely need some fondant. This is called an eek. It's just a, an extra box to lift up the hive higher. So then I can place this on top so the food isn't causing a problem with putting the lid on. So here are the Varroa mite boards and we can come back in a week and just check that the treatment did the job. Slots in just like that. And now there's not a great deal to do apart from keep an eye on the, uh, the way to the hives, make sure they've always got some fondant icing to eat in case they get low on food. And I guess I will see these bees again in the spring. And this season I'm putting a little bit more effort into my record keeping because my memory is terrible. And I want to keep track of everything that I do in the beehives and the dates that I do everything so I can then look back on it and know what I've done. Last year I was very unorganized. I lost a number of swarms because I wasn't keeping track of when things were happening. I'm, a, I'm gonna be a better beekeeper this year. And that is all done. See you in the spring. They're really small, kind of purpley brown things, <laughs> quite hard to spot. Most of this on here is what looks like wax cappings, some pollen. Because when they eat through their honey stores, they then drop the wax cappings onto, the, onto these boards. There's also a few dead bees. There's one mite, two mites. So to find a daily mite drop, which is how many mites drop in each day, you do some quick maths. There were two mites divided by seven, which is how many days. So I have a daily mite drop, which is how beekeepers measure the amount of mites of 0 0.28, which I believe is a very safe level now. Um, before, when I put the treatment in, I had a daily mite drop of about 10 or so. That's very good. And on the other hive, three mites on this one. But just because there aren't many mites now doesn't mean that next season they won't come back. Uh, there's a very good chance that throughout the season next year the, the mite levels will grow again uh, when they are reproducing more throughout the spring and summer. And then we'll have to do the same again next year uh, and, and treat them and make sure that you keep them under, under control. But at the moment, I think things are good. Well, my dad has finally given in to letting me have some more space in the garden for more beehives. So my plan for this next season is to expand. I want to go from two colonies to maybe, hmm, as many as I can fit over there. There's quite a bit of preparation I need to do before I get the beehives there. We need to clean out the space. We need to level off the ground. I need to make some hive stands to put the beehives on. And I think this spot here is a, is a very nice area because southwest is that way. So the prevailing wind comes from over there. So the bees will be sheltered behind the bush. 
the sun rises, I think, over there, southeast, which means they'll get early morning sun, which is good. And there, yeah. So you can go down to think. When I work on them, one facing that way, one facing this way, yeah. and one facing... So you don't mind me having more bees in the garden? More bees, more honey. If you're gonna do it, you might as well do it properly. We're gonna make a start clearing Alex's apiary area. This is the year where Alex's beekeeping business expands into a multi-million pound company where we ship honey all the, all the way across the world and become the biggest beekeeping operation in the world. Seriously though, I want to expand my beekeeping. I want to have more than two hives because I want more honey. Because it turned out that last year, lots of people wanted to buy my honey and I couldn't sell them it because I had none of it. I ate most of it and gave some away to neighbors so I had none left. I got a notepad, tape measure. We got a fork, a oh, rake. That's a rake. And two people and we're gonna clean up the area. Secretaires. It's already looking cleaner. Three hive stands. They are what the hives stand on. I'm gonna make them out of wood. We found a frog. <laughs> I'm gonna put him in the undergrowth. One, two, three. Next step is to make some hive stands. Me and my dad are collecting wood for the for the beehive stands. There we are. Oh well, my dad has shot me in the back. <laughs> 108 pounds for the wood. I learned that this wood most likely came from Scandinavia, which is not surprising because from my observations whilst traveling in that part of the world, they have a lot of trees. Today's job is to get on with some woodwork. I've got to build some stands for my beehives to sit on. And I've also got to build a tortoise shelter for my dad. My dad has a pet tortoise and the tortoise needs a new house for next spring because the other one rotted away. And today I'm going to be fueled by three eggs. These eggs come from a chicken. I'm gonna scramble them. Yum. My dad found a tortoise on an allotment when he was a kid and it's still alive now. I think it's something like 70, 80 years old. In the summer, she comes out of hibernation and lives in the garden. And in the day, she's roaming about in the garden and in the night, she goes into her little hut. The plan for the beehive stands is pretty simple. I'm just making a oblong shape out of wood and then having four legs made out of these posts for the hives to sit on. Stick fit. All I have to do is some cutting and some screwing. That's, a, that's about it. There we go. That is a stand that my bees are gonna sit on. I've got this floor of a spare beehive so I can test. And it fits on there perfectly. I'll be able to fit three beehives on each stand. So we've got an awful lot of space uh, if we need it. Now I just have to do the same again two more times. I'm gonna have three of these stands. It's a chilly day today. It was about minus five last night. So the bees will probably all be tucked up inside their hive. I'm gonna put my bee suit on and I'm gonna get one of the hive stands in place. I'm getting my bee suit on just in case, if anything, it's an extra layer of warmth. Cause it's so cold today. The bees are very quiet today. There's no bees flying. They're probably all tucked inside the hive. Huddling together like penguins. Ah, that's heavy. That is really heavy. It's quite wonky.
I opened up the hives and had a look inside and they're feeding on their fondant icing, which I gave them. I am being prepared for what could happen. If I divide both those hives there once, I have four colonies. And then if I catch a swarm or I divide one of them again, I have seven. And that's pretty much like beehives on all of them. So I built some hive stands for my beehives and I thought, nice job done. And then my dad comes walking into the garden one day and he's like, you're gonna paint them? And I say, no, they do the job as they are. Don't really need to paint them, do I? And he said, no, you need to paint them because they don't look very nice and they need to be certain type of green or something. So I'm doing this purely to make him happy. I don't think they need to be plain painted. The bees don't need them to be painted. I've already got paint on my thumb. I'm gonna paint some wood. Painting has been interrupted because my dad is getting very excited about something in his greenhouse. <laughs> Look at that. What type of orchid is it? It's a cymbidium. If I had a bigger greenhouse, I'd probably have more. Mm. They look very... Delicate. Um, chic. It's like having a pet, yeah. I suppose. Nice, that was fun. Um, let's do some more painting. Working around interesting people is it's definitely something I enjoy because it can be very easy to get bogged down with your own job and having a little break and conversation with uh, someone else who is doing their thing, you know, it breaks it up a bit, creates a nice balance. Painting. Finding lots of my bees on like this potting bench outside the house. But they're on the plant as well. Uh, I think they're drinking water. Well, that one's like in the water. They're making the most of the lovely weather today. Hey bees, how you doing? It's the last day of January and it's feeling pretty warm the sun is out and the bees are just going crazy it's the most active i've seen them since last like september time there's quite a few bees coming in with pollen on their legs which is a good sign because it means that they are finding flowers there's a lot of bees about which is good oh it's so good to see my little friends again they've been just tucked away inside their box all winter and i've hardly seen them they seem pretty docile at the moment as well they're not in an angry mood like they were last autumn. They really don't care that I'm standing so close to them. We still have about a month or two where it could get cold again, but uh, we should start to see more and more signs of spring coming. There's flowers starting to appear on some of the trees. Uh, the daffodils and snowdrops are coming out as well. Spring's coming. Now that I had some really nice painted beehive stands, I needed some more beehives to put on them. So I did some online bee shopping uh, for some new equipment. Whoa, this is expensive. It does look like an extraordinary price to pay for some boxes and beekeeping equipment, but I like to see it as an investment. You know, if this year goes well, then we might have a load of honey to sell and I might make that money back. So it kind of feels worth it. And also I'm probably gonna have loads of fun as well. So it doesn't feel so bad. Ah, oh, it's starting to feel more like spring. Today I'm picking up all my beekeeping equipment that I ordered online the other day. Luckily there's a local bee farm about half an hour away. So I can go to them pick up all the boxes and all the kit that I need for this year of beekeeping. Just getting everything prepared. Beekeeping season 
starts in about a month. That's when I'll have to start doing regular inspections of the bees. So I've got the next four weeks to prepare everything ready for that time. It's down this little country road and it's like a, um, like a drive-through, but for bee equipment. <laughs> That's so funny. I just picked up my beekeeping stuff and it turns out that the guys who work here um, had seen my beekeeping videos that I put on YouTube last year, which is kind of funny. It's mad. The world of social media connects so many different people. And just by me uploading a beekeeping video last year, like these people had seen it. Anyway, that's all the beekeeping equipment collected. I've now got to prepare everything over the next month, ready for my year of beekeeping. I am surrounded by lots of pieces of wood. And this year I want to expand my beekeeping operation slightly. So I thought today, whilst making up these beehives, I can show you and explain how a beehive is made up. Starting off with the, the wood. This is a Canadian cedar. Uh, it's a special kind of wood because it contains certain oils uh, that help it last longer and stay strong. However, cedar, this particular type of wood, is very expensive. And right here, surrounding me, is like hundreds of pounds worth of wood. Anyway, let's make some beehives, shall we? Now, I'm working with flat-packed beehive parts today. You can, you can, of course, if you're good at working with wood, make beehives from scratch. You can make your own wood, do all the notches yourself, However, I am no good with woodworking, especially accurate woodworking. So I have bought the pieces required and then I simply have to slot them together. So it shouldn't be too tricky. Smells nice. There's so many different parts in this one box. Give me a couple of minutes while I read this. Didn't take long. I'm already confused about all these bits of wood and where they're meant to fit into each other. I'll need to follow along on a YouTube tutorial at the same time, so this might take a while. Oh gosh, that took me about an hour. I thought putting these boxes together would be easy. We got one box done and I've got another five more to do. <sighs> I did a lot of frame building last year, so I think I remember how to do it. Pieces of wood, small nails, foundation. This is beeswax, and it's not absolutely necessary to make this because the bees will make the wax themselves, but it gives them a head start, and it also means that the frame is built uniformly in the shape of the frame. Because if you leave the bees to do it, the bees are likely to build like a wild comb shape. And for beekeeping purposes, you want it to be neat and uh, nice and oblong. Put the last piece of wood in. And there we have one of many that I need to make. But this goes into the beehive, and I'll show you that once I've built all the others. I spent the last couple of days in the house building boxes, and now I can show you how a beehive is made up. First, you've got the floor and the entrance block. With the floor I bought, you get a board which slides into the floor. This is the board that you can use to check 
Varroa mites. You can slide this in, then count how many are dropping through onto the board so you know if you have a problem. Goes onto the hive stand like so. Next, we got the brood box. Now the brood box is where the queen lays all the eggs. The brood box contains 12 of these frames. They're slightly deeper than the honey frames. The bees will draw out the comb and this is where they will have their nest. Next goes on this. This is a funny looking thing, but it's called a queen excluder. The worker bees can go through these little holes, but the queen can't. So you put this on top of the brood box so that when we have the honey supers on, these are the honey boxes where the bees store the honey, the queen can't get up through into the honey super and lay eggs in the honey section because you don't really want baby bees uh, inside your honey. As you can see, there's quite a size difference. The brood frame is larger than the honey frame. Now you can have honey frames the same size, but the idea I think behind having smaller honey frames is that they are very heavy to carry when they're full. So when you have a whole box, it's easier for the beekeeper to have a smaller frame to deal with. In some situations, you might have two of these brood boxes on top of each other so that the brood nest is really big and strong. On top of that honey box, you can then put as many honey boxes as you like. The amount of honey boxes that you have depends on how much honey your bees are making. You don't want to have loads of empty boxes which aren't being used. So if one fills up, you might add another one. And if the other one starts filling up, you might add another one. And then you just sort of play it by ear and see how many uh, you need. I've seen some hives with up to 10 of these boxes on full of honey, like this high, uh, where you need a ladder to get the whole way up. But that all depends on how much honey your bees are making. More honey, more boxes. Once you've put your last honey box on top of your hive, you then need uh, a lid. This is called a crown board. This goes on top, like so. That acts as the top of the bee's cavity. You may have noticed some holes in here. Now these are for when you need to feed the bees, uh, you can put feeders on top. And also when you're extracting the honey, you can put these little devices in, which mean the bees can go one way, but can't come out the other way. So you can empty a box full of bees by putting this under one of the supers. All the bees go through down there, then they can't get back up. So you've got a whole box without any bees in. And then lastly, and this goes on top. And there we have a complete cedar beehive. All we're missing is uh, some bees. But hopefully at some point this year, we might be able to split one of those original colonies and get another one. I'm really excited because it's finally warming up a bit and in a few weeks, maybe a month or two, we'll be able to look inside the hives and see what the bees have been up to. My bees survived the winter and I'm so happy about this because I hear some pretty tragic stories of beekeepers having all their bees die off in the winter months. This can happen for a number of reasons. They can run out of food, they can get affected by pests and diseases, or they can get cold and damp. But right now I am very grateful and happy that my bees have survived and they, they look like they're thriving. There, there's so many bees flying in and out the entrances. Loads of pollen is coming in on their pollen sacs on their hind legs, which is a really good sign because the pollen is food for the baby bees. It's high in protein. Anyway, it looks like the bees are very healthy looking from the outside, but today we're gonna to do our first inspection of both the hives and we're gonna have a look at what's going on inside. I'm going to light my smoker, put my hood on my bee suit, try not to get stung, and I'm gonna show you inside the beehive. Birch bark. I've got some new gloves. These ones are like a leathery material and they go up your arm so far. I don't think I'm ever gonna be stung through this, but also I don't think I'll be able to feel through the gloves very easily. 
Ideally, you want to have good sense through your fingers so you can pick up the frames easily. And these gloves are a little bit thick and feel a bit clumsy. But we'll give it a go. I'm coming in, bees. Just letting them know I'm here. That there is the food that I've been feeding them. It might look a bit brutal, but the way you normally get bees off things is to shake them. Smoke. Hive tool. You need this to break open the hive parts. There's a lot of bees in there. There's bees in between every single frame, which I think is a sign of a strong colony of bees. Let's have a look inside, shall we? I'm smoking myself. See how they all just go down when you smoke them? And then because they're away, it avoids you squashing them with your fingers when you're trying to open it up. So this is just a board which fills the space in the hive. Bees! Oh wow, that frame is heavy. Oh wow, that's full of honey, that frame. Frame number one, full of honey. This could be honey that they stored last year or maybe even honey that they have started making this year, I'm not too sure. It means they've got loads of food and animals need food. Wow, that frame is also full of honey. That is heavy. They have got so much honey stored. It's quite overwhelming looking inside a beehive as there's so much going on. These first few frames just contained honey. This is because the bees store their food on the end frames of a hive and also above the nest area. If you think of it like a, a round ball, which is the nest, and then above and to the side of that nest is where they store the food. As we get further into the hive, we'll begin to see the nest, which contains the eggs and brood. Eggs! I've just found eggs. Which means there's a queen in here laying the eggs. The eggs will either turn into female worker bees or male drone bees. It's fascinating how the queen lays her eggs. To lay a female worker bee, she allows the egg to become fertilized by opening a little valve that lets sperm come in contact with the egg before it is laid in a cell. However, if she wants to lay a male bee, she lays an unfertilized egg. In a colony of honeybees, you need both males and females. The male bees' job is to mate with queen bees, but not the one in their own colony, as that would be inbreeding. The females do everything else, from raising the brood, to making honey and looking after the queen. So there's lots of pollen in there. Pollen, drone brood, worker brood. It's got everything it needs. That one's dancing. If you weren't aware already, bees can dance. Can't use my phone with these gloves. Dancing bee, look at it. That wiggling bee there is telling all the other bees where to find the food. They're all watching it. There's a lot of pollen in this frame. Just wanted to show you what a frame looks like when there's no bees on it. Look at all of that. That is capped over worker brood. There's some drone brood at the top, those larger lumps, but that's mostly worker brood. And there's some bees actually hatching out of there right now. They're being born. You can do it. Squeeze. Go on, son. I mean, daughter. One last push. 
and she's alive. That bee is 10 seconds old. This is what the world looks like. Wow, that's amazing. We just watched life happen. I've got a male bee on my hand. They don't have a stinger. Another frame full of bees and brood. I found the queen and she is the same queen that we had last year that I marked with a little yellow pen. That's so cool. Yeah, we still got yellow queen. It's mad, that one queen has laid all these eggs and is the mum to all these bees. The queen always seems to have a group of worker bees surrounding her. I think that's because they constantly look after her as she is very important to the colony. I hear a bum, there's a bumblebee underneath my hive. Three more frames left to have a look at. Oh my goodness, like what? They just sometimes go nuts like that. They just decide that you're the enemy. That's a cool looking frame. And last frame is full of honey and pollen. I'm just gonna scrape all this extra wax that they've built off the top. Cause that will make inspecting them in the future harder. If there's a load of wax in there. I'll be able to melt this wax down and turn it into candles as well. Before I put the lid on this hive, I'm going to add a couple of things. Firstly, we've got this metal sheet with holes in. These holes are of the right size so that worker bees can go through them, but the queen can't. So I put this on top of the brood box where the queen lives. So the queen won't go into the honey box, which I'm about to put on. We don't want the queen laying eggs in the honey. You just want there to be honey and nothing else. So if you only let worker bees up, then you'll only get honey. This is called a super. It's just a box full of frames where the bees will make the honey. All these frames are already drawn out. Can you see? These frames had honey in them last year and they're ready just to be filled back up with honey. Last year I started with just sheets of foundation wax, which is basically a sheet of wax which hasn't been drawn out yet. But these are completely ready to be stored with honey. We should give us a head start this year, which means we should get more honey. Not all was good though, as some of the frames that I had been storing from last season had been eaten away by wax moth. It's a type of moth that, when it's in its larval stage, it eats through beeswax, leaving behind a trail of silk threads. I was just hoping the bees would do a good job of tidying up the mess the wax moth had made. There's 12 frames in this box, and by having an extra box on the hive, that firstly gives the bees more space, they won't be so cramped in the bottom box, and that means the bees are less likely to try and swarm. If they haven't got any space, they're gonna think, geez, we need to find a new home and half the bees will leave and, and find a new home elsewhere. By adding this extra box, they have more space, they have space to store honey, and they should be less likely to swarm. The lid goes on, followed by the roof. I'm very pleased that this hive is healthy and looking good. Hopefully it will make me lots of honey this year. Now I'm gonna check in my other hive. Oh, there's me queen. That queen's bigger.
Hive number two is also looking really good. There's loads of dancing bees on this frame. Yay! Both hives have loads of bees in them. They have stores of food, they have a queen, they have new emerging brood that are hatching, and they are flying loads today, bringing in so much pollen. It can only be a good thing. And this is just the start of the beekeeping season because from now until the end of summer, I need to check these bees and do an inspection like this every single week. And the main reason for checking them once a week is to prevent them from swarming. And the main reason for not wanting them to swarm is that it means I lose half my bees and they take loads of honey with them when they go. So I want to not let them swarm. And if you check them once a week, you can spot signs of swarming and control it and prevent the swarm from happening. I will see you soon. So much goes into beekeeping and not a day goes past without me at least thinking about how my bees are getting on. It's been a busy spring and summer so far and the bees have been starting to make some honey, which is great. Honey's coming in. But I've also had some disasters. So I found this dead queen bee in another one of my hives. So that's not good. Anyway, back in April, I was attempting to expand my apiary and divide one of my hives. I've got two beehives in the garden, but I am greedy and I want more. And there's something you can do in the spring and summer, which is divide one colony into two, or even more than that. And that is the plan. We're going to take this hive here. I call it hive number one, because it was my original colony. And we're going to do some manipulations within the hive, move some of the frames about to encourage them to make a new queen, which in turn will mean a new colony. Anyway, I'm in the, I'm in the flight path of all the bees. So I'm getting hit in the face. We got the smoker smoking. God, it's jam packed with bees and they're angry. <laughs> this is the sound of a bee trying to sting my microphone. For some reason, these bees were in a bad mood today. Anyway, the first step was to find the queen. Luckily, this wasn't too tricky as I had marked her with a yellow pen last year. There we go, I found the queen. And this frame is gonna go into this new box. So we're taking the queen away from the original colony. Now we need to take a few other things out of this hive. I'm going to add a frame of food in there as well, because they obviously need some food to eat. But I will also feed them with some extra sugar syrup to help them out as well. That's going to go in here as well. I'm also going to add this whole frame of brood and bees. Once these bees hatch, which will be only a matter of days because they're already capped over, there will be plenty of space for the queen to lay again. Because basically this colony is really small now and we want it to grow as quick as possible. So that's gonna go in here. And as well as three frames, we're also gonna shake some extra bees in. Because lots of these bees will fly back to this hive. So we need to add more than we think we need so that even once quite a lot of them have flown back home, there'll still be some left in here. And because we took three frames out of this hive, we got to replace it with some new frames with fresh foundation. That's just wax which hasn't been drawn out yet. Add a couple to this side. Move these bees. So we're done with this box for now. What we've basically done is make this colony queenless. It doesn't have a queen, which means the bees are going to start making queen cells so they can raise a new queen. We're done with that for now. Now, ideally, you would move this hive at least three miles away. This is to stop the bees from returning back to the original colony 
but I don't have anywhere else to put the bees so I'm going to keep them in the garden but what I have done is change the direction of the entrance so it's facing that way rather than that way and I've moved it as far away from the other hives as I can to hopefully make them feel like they're in a new place. I've also got some grass trimmings because I've heard that you can you can put this in the entrance to slow the bees down so they don't just go out and then back to the original place. If you slow them down a bit, they're more likely to reorientate to this new box, I think. I don't know. I don't understand bees. And there we go. I've stuffed some grass in to slow them down. They'll be able to move that out over time. These are very lucky bees. They've got a brand new hive. Well, we'll see if any of the stuff we did actually works. I made notes of all the things that I did to keep track of everything because my memory is absolutely terrible. So right now, hive one has no queen, but the bees should start raising a new one over the next few days. The new box which I made up doesn't need as much attention. It already has everything it needs. However, because there are lots of empty frames in this new hive, I gave them some help in the form of sugar syrup. This would help them draw out the new comb and ensure that they don't starve. One week later, I checked up on the queenless hive one. They had made a load of queen cells and it was my job now to remove all of them but one that would become the new queen. That is the queen cell that we're going to keep and a new queen is going to hatch out of there. Today the bees were more aggressive. I think it's because they don't have a queen currently. Well that was a bit stressful trying to go through the whole hive and find just one queen cell that I was going to keep. Now it's a bit controversial. Some people say you should leave more than one. Other people say if you leave more than one there's a chance that they will swarm which I don't want them to do. I've kept just one. So one queen bee will hatch in about a week's time and then soon after it's born, it will then go out and mate. Once it's come back from its mating flight, then we have a fully functioning colony ready for this year's honey production. Whilst inspecting one of my other hives, I saw signs that they were planning on swarming soon. The sign that you look for are queen cells along the edges of a frame. As a beekeeper, you don't want your bees to swarm as this means you're likely to lose many of them, including your current queen. But you can split the colony up, similar to the split I did with my other hive, to make them think that they have already swarmed. Like before, I took the queen away in another box along with a few other frames. The original box could then make their new queen and because the old queen was now moved, they wouldn't try to fly off and swarm. A week later, I returned to the colony that was trying to swarm and removed all but one queen cell, like I did before. This beekeeping sure has taken up more of my time than I first expected it to. I thought it was going to be a simple, easy hobby, but I was very wrong. Pretty much every day, there's something to do. And the bees have also been really busy with all the spring flowers appearing. Whilst driving around the countryside, I was seeing loads of fields of oilseed rape flowers. And whilst out on walks, I was noticing flowers everywhere. I'm on a roundabout and there's dandelions everywhere. All of that is bee food. I've never stood in a roundabout before, but this is kind of fun. It made me so happy to know that my bees had plenty of resources available after such a long, wet winter. There's another way of getting hold of more bees and it's by catching a swarm. So naturally, bees in the forest over there or a beekeeper down the road, uh, their colonies might swarm and they'll be looking for a new home. And if I can create the ideal environment for them and set a few boxes, beekeepers call them swarm traps, uh, those bees that are swarming can find these boxes and decide to uh, call it a home. And all you need to set a swarm trap is to have a box. I've got two boxes here. This is a slightly larger wooden one. This one's a polystyrene one. And I've heard a few drops of this inside the box can attract bees. This is lemongrass oil. And when I first heard about this, I was like, that is, that's a gimmick, surely. That's, that can't be true. Why would lemongrass oil attract bees? Anyway, I looked into it and now it makes absolute sense because it says here, in a honeybee, the Nasanov pheromone is made up of a variety of components, including citral. Citral just so happens to be one of the main natural components found in lemongrass oil. So bees communicate using this pheromone and lemongrass oil contains the same thing. Oh wow, that smells amazing. And now 
we can go in the garden and try and find a couple of places to put these boxes in hope to catch a swarm of bees. Wouldn't it be so cool if we can catch a swarm out of here? I can smell the oil, so that's gonna be doing its job. Fingers crossed. And the swarm traps are set. Now all we've got to do is wait and hope that some bees want to live there. I'll keep you updated with how it goes. Most likely we'll get nothing, but there's always a chance. On my next checkup, I found a number of worrying things. Firstly, a load of ants. I've heard this isn't too much of a problem if you have a healthy colony, as they are strong enough to not let the ants take over. This is cinnamon, cinnamon bark. And I've just crumbled it around the lid. Apparently ants don't like cinnamon. We'll see about that. I'll be honest, the cinnamon trick didn't end up working, not one bit, so instead I just brushed all the ants off each time I checked up on the bees. This seemed to work a lot better. The next thing I found was much worse than some ants. I found one of my queen bees dead. I have just found in one of my hives a dead queen being pulled around by worker bees. So that's not good. Just when you think you've got things under control, you realize that you really haven't. I'm not sure why this has happened, but I hope the colony would be able to make themselves a new queen over the next few weeks. Since I made that split of the beehives 30 days ago, a new queen should have been born, and then it should have mated with male bees and returned back to the hive and hopefully now be laying eggs. But as I found out last year, beekeeping doesn't always go to plan. But what we're looking for today is a new queen. We don't have to spot the queen, we just have to see eggs. If we see eggs, then we know that the queen is there. And if we see the queen, well that's a bonus. And if we are lucky enough to find the queen, she's gonna get a little dot of red pen on her thorax, I think that's what it's called. You don't need to do it, but it helps find your queen when you want to do future manipulations within the hive. And the reason for it being red is because if the year number ends in a three, uh, red is the international color you use, so you know how old your queen bee is. There's thunder in the distance, so I'm gonna try and get this done as quick as possible. And to make things a little bit more tricky, the hive that I'm working with is a bit angry. The other day, a bee came out of the hive and stung me on my belly button. Yes, it was painful. Very. This is so nerve wracking because if there isn't a queen or no sign of a queen, it means that the queen either hasn't mated successfully or that the whole thing failed way earlier on and a new queen never even emerged. Quite heavy, those boxes. I looked really carefully for a sign of a new queen, but saw nothing. Not only have I not got a queen in this hive, these bees are ravenous and they're just destroying the frames. Look at that, they're just taking it apart. Ah, oh dear, what are we gonna do? We've got no queen. It all failed. Now I'm pretty sure there is no queen in this hive. There's no eggs, no sign of a queen, and it's been 30 days since I did the split. However, there could be a queen in there which hasn't mated yet, and I'm not finding any eggs because the queen hasn't mated. The way to check whether this hive has a queen in or not is to get some eggs from another hive, put them into this hive, and if they try to make a new queen, it means that they haven't got a queen in there. If they don't try to make a new queen from those eggs, then it's because they've already got one. I've got a frame of eggs in that hive, so we will see whether there's a queen in there. Well, they may not have had a queen for the past month, but they have been storing lots of honey. Look at that. Hopefully we're gonna be able to harvest that in a few months time. Oh, that's not great. Not a great day. But we'll get the problem fixed. I don't quite know what's happening with Hive 1 right now, but I can confirm that this hive here, Hive number 4, is doing brilliant. It has a queen, the colony is expanding really quick, and I'm going to put on a queen excluder and 
a honey super. Now you can make some honey in here. Look, there's already a bee on the frame. In here, I've just got wax foundation and the bees can get busy now. It's five days after I added this frame of eggs and brood from the other hive. And this has confirmed to me that there is not a queen in this hive because they have been trying to make another queen. They've drawn two queen cells up there, another one here, another one here at the bottom. They've actually got one capped over there. So that is the test that you do to see if you have a queen. And it turns out that this hive, something happened to the queen. There's a few things that we could do now. We could leave that frame in there, leave all those queen cells, let one of them hatch, and then uh, the queen can go out and mate and hopefully uh, keep this colony going. However, it's already been 30 days or 35 days. So they haven't been laying any eggs for over a month which means no new bees uh, are being born. And I can actually see that this colony is, is gradually getting smaller and smaller as the older bees die off and no bees are being born. So because these bees have already been queenless for so long, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a queen bee. The other good thing about buying in a mated queen bee is that you can select the sort of genetics that you want to be in your colony. The Buckfast strain are known for being gentle and easy to work with. And these bees have been getting quite angry recently. So by putting in a queen with good genetics, that should help in the long run as well. It does cost a bit of money. I'm going to have to pay for this new bee, but I'm hoping it will be a good investment for these bees. So that's the plan. I'll still have to come back in a few days time and remove all the extra queen cells that they've made because they will desperately try and make more queen cells from the larvae that are in here. But luckily we know that they're only gonna be on this frame. Let's get the lid back on this hive and buy a new queen. Look at this, mated buckfast queen, 40 quid for one of those. And I'm getting two of them, because hive one needs a queen and also the hive which I found the dead queen in needs a queen. Add the cart. Wait, what have I got for? Two. Check out. Queen rearing is another part of beekeeping and takes skill, lots of patience and a little bit of luck. But thanks to bee farmers all over the world, hobby beekeepers like me can easily get their hands on a new queen. I've actually been learning more about queen rearing with my local beekeepers club and they have been working on trying to raise their own queens for the members. It's really nice weather today. The bees are very active and it feels good. There's so many flowers everywhere as well. Anyway, the last few weeks, my bees have been controlling my life. I've had all sorts of things going on, swarming bees. I've been splitting colonies up to try and expand my apiary. And what the past few weeks have taught me is how important having mated queen bees are. You need a queen in your colony to lay all the eggs. If you don't have the queen, the colony just starts to fail and you're not going to get any honey and they're going to die. So having a queen, not only a queen, but you need it to be mated. You need it to be able to lay viable eggs that turn into uh, worker bees. And this week, I'm going to be playing around with this. This is a tiny little beehive. The bees can go in through that entrance. And uh, in here is basically what is in one of the bigger boxes but it's just miniature and what this is for is just getting a queen mated so my local beekeeping club have been doing a queen rearing operation it's quite a lengthy task so i won't go into detail in this video but this week i'm going to pick up a single queen cell from one of the apiaries where they've been doing this queen rearing and i need a place for that queen cell to emerge and get mated and you use these little boxes. Whilst talking about it to the camera, I feel like you must be getting bored. So in here, it looks a bit like one of the other hives. It's a polystyrene box and there's three frames. I've got a strip of foundation, so a strip of wax where the bees can start drawing their comb from. I've then got a feeder on one side where I'm going to put some fondant, which is what bakers use as a type of sugar. And to prepare this box for collecting my queen cell in a few days, I'm going to head down to the hives and take out a cup full of bees. 
Next step is to shake some bees into the bucket. We want 300 milliliters of bees, so I thought the best way would be to use a measuring jug. And close it up. I'm gonna put these in a dark place for a few days and then we're going to introduce a queen cell into this little box. I'm gonna go in the garage. It's dark and cool in here. Listen to them. Apparently they do this when they've been separated from their queen. They're, they're making a roaring sound. I think I should probably tell my dad that there's bees in the garage. Otherwise he'll come in here and probably get a nasty shock. I've also got a spray bottle of water, so I'm going to spray the bees uh, a couple of times a day to keep them cool. We're going on an adventure. I'm hoping they don't get too hot in here. It's time to collect my queen cell. <laughs> it feels so odd to be sat in the car driving my bees. Put your seatbelt on. I arrived at the club apiary and we looked in the hive housing the queen cells. There were 14 drawn out queen cells on the frame. All of these have the potential to hatch into new queens. These cells were carefully removed and placed into their new homes and I was lucky enough to take one for my little box. You can probably see why most people choose to buy a mated queen. So much time goes into raising queens yourself. Oh gosh, I just got stung on my head. Hopefully it doesn't swell up too much. I'm gonna bring these bees home and pop them in the garden. I think I'm gonna put these in the shade down here. Right, we're gonna open this up. And they're away. They're just figuring out where they are. And now we've got to wait for maybe three weeks for that new queen to hatch. And then once it's hatched, it should go out and mate, come back, start laying eggs. And then we will know whether this whole thing has worked. Bees in the bushes. I just received my queen bees in the post. Definitely the most unusual parcel I've ever had addressed to my name. Inside the package were these plastic boxes. Inside the plastic boxes is a queen with a pink dot on its head, as well as a number of worker bees. And there's this one bee here, which is getting quite excited. Can probably sense the queen's pheromones. But this queen is going into this hive because currently this hive hasn't got a queen. It's just mind blowing that you can, you can buy a mated honeybee queen to put into your colony. And this queen here has been bred for good genetics and hopefully it will uh, help this colony out. It'll be a little bit calmer and they'll sting me less. Right, you're getting a new queen. They've got a little bit of honey in there. It is quite heavy now, actually. I've opened up these tabs, which will allow the bees from the inside and outside to eat through and they meet in the middle. And you want the bees in the colony to eat through slowly so that they get used to each other. Because I've heard sometimes if you introduce the queen too quickly, they can actually kill the queen, which isn't good. So we want it to be a slow introduction. I want to see how they react. Whoa, they are really interested. Queen cage is in there. We'll come back in a couple of days and see how they're getting on. I've also got to put this queen in that one over there, because that one, the queen died. Over the next few weeks, things started to look much more under control. One of my hives, which I split about 30 days ago, now had a new mated queen. We have a mated queen. That bee there with the red dot is now laying eggs. So this colony here, colony number two, is all good. I've just checked up on the new queen bees and they have been released from their cage. We have a new queen in here. We have a new queen in that one and a new queen in that one. Oh yeah. And there she is with the pink dot. 
as our Buckfast Queen. Although Hive 1 now had a new mated queen, these new eggs wouldn't hatch for another 20 days. The worker bees in this hive were getting old and I was seeing so many dead bees. This colony was shrinking rapidly so I felt like I needed to do something. I still had one queenless colony so I decided to unite the two hives together. This was done by placing newspaper between the boxes. It's important to do this to stop them fighting when two colonies meet. I made some small holes in the paper and over the next few days they should chew their way through and become one colony. You can see the bees have chewed through the newspaper. I just realised one of the pieces of paper I used has got a load of honeybees on. In a matter of days this hive is going to be so strong because there's so many bees here which will hatch out very soon. And now that they have a new queen they can lay more eggs and hopefully going into the summer this should be a really strong colony that can go out and forage loads of nectar. It's two weeks since I put the queen cell inside this little polystyrene box and I'm going to do my first bit of beekeeping without a bee suit. Now this could go terribly wrong. These bees in here, they're such a small colony and they're mostly quite young bees so they should be quite chilled. But what I'm looking for is a mated queen. So we want to see some eggs in there. This is very exciting, but also quite nerve wracking because this whole thing could have failed. The chance of me getting stung is very high. You can see they've built out all the comb. No way, there's eggs. There's eggs in here, which means there's a queen and it's mated. Tiny little white, they're like small grains of rice. Wow, it's actually worked. It is quite nice to not wear gloves or a whole suit, especially on a hot day like today. Oh, loads more eggs in there. It's so beautiful, like the comb is just so nice. There's the queen. Gosh, she's looking gorgeous. So she has mated. So I can put her into my colony which doesn't have a queen still. Well that's a great result. I am so happy this whole thing worked. So it's the 10th of June and as things stand we have five beehives in the garden. However not all of them are going to produce us honey this year. I have two hives which are particularly strong. Uh, those are going to be the honey production hives. Hive number four has three honey boxes on top and hive number two has two honey boxes on top and I'm really excited to see how the rest of this summer goes and fingers crossed the weather stays good and the bees can forage loads of nectar and produce us plenty of honey by the end of this summer. It's finally time for the honey harvest. These boxes here are full of honey and it's time to extract it. I have been waiting all year for this day and I'm so excited to see how much honey we can harvest. The bees have been working so hard over the past few months trying to collect as much nectar as they can from the local flowers. The plan over the next couple of days is to get all the honey from the beehives into the kitchen and extracted and put into jars. It's the 22nd of June, so midsummer, and the bees have been so busy recently. I've got two boxes here. I spent the last couple of hours making up these frames because I think I'm going to give them more space to store more honey. I'm feeling optimistic and the reason I'm giving them more space is because these boxes are getting incredibly heavy. Well, that is really heavy and there's two of these boxes on here. So that is a frame of almost solid honey and the other side is also almost full as well. I'm going to give them another box in attempt to get even more honey. We don't want to let any of the nectar that they're collecting go to waste, so they always need somewhere to put it. So now they've got three boxes on here, and they can go up and make honey. However, they have to first draw out the comb, because on here is currently just sheets of foundation, just wax. They have to draw it out and then fill it with honey. So it might take them a bit of time, it might be a bit of work for them, but I've got faith in you little insects. And the lid goes on. And now we wait. The hives are getting tall. 
and as long as they keep filling up the boxes with nectar, I can keep adding more and more boxes. It's the 29th of June and this hive here has just been so busy the last week and they are collecting so much nectar. I can smell it, it smells amazing. And also, if I put my ear to the box, I can hear them. And what they're doing is they're fanning their wings to dry out the nectar because honey is nectar with much of the moisture removed. So they fan their wings and, and move air over it to evaporate the water. My other hive here is also doing well, but not as well as this one. And then I've got three smaller hives and they are not doing too much. They're not very strong, but I'm hoping that I can overwinter those. So then next year, they will be the honey producing hives. Before we actually take the honey, we need to check whether the honey is ready to be taken. Once the water content is below 20%, you can call it honey and it will last a long time in storage. If there's more water in the honey, then there's a chance it can ferment, which means it doesn't last. So I'm going to go through the hive and just check that it's ready to take out. Now the bees are getting a bit aggressive at this time of year. And I think it's because they've got all this honey in storage and they are being very protective over it. They don't want animals coming in and stealing it. And there has actually been a few wasps about. My colony of bees that was sat just here actually got completely wiped out by wasps the other day. The wasps came, ate all their honey, ate all their stores, and there were no bees left in that hive, which is very sad. So this top box here was just a test really to see if the bees were still bringing in enough nectar to fill, fill it up with honey. But it turns out that I think the nectar flow has stopped because you can see here, they haven't drawn out any of the wax and they slowed down a lot with bringing in the nectar. We're gonna put this box down to the side. Now this is where it gets interesting. This box here is full. You know when you've got lots of honey because it's so heavy. Wow. And that honey is ready to take off the hive. Now there's a couple of different ways you can tell if honey is ripe. Once the water content is low enough, they cap it over with wax. And that's what this layer is over the, the surface. That is a wax layer that protects the honey and keeps it in the cells. I wish I could hand this to you so you could feel the weight of it. It's so heavy. It, it's, a, it's a solid block of honeycomb. So this frame here, you can see that it's not capped over like the other one, but a way that you can see if it's ready is to turn it upside down and give it a shake. None of the honey is flying out of the cells, which means that it's, it's not too liquidy. The water content is low enough that that is also ready to take. The smell that's coming off of this is incredible. This box here is all honey, which is ready. And it's so heavy. Another fully capped frame. I think all of these frames here are capped. Oh, this one's even heavier. Gosh. I keep seeing the odd wasp, which is trying to get into the hive. But the bees, because there's so many of them, they're quite good at stopping them. And this is the final box, which interestingly is the least filled box. It was the first super that I put on the hives and they use this super often for storing pollen. And over here, there's just pollen and no honey. But then around the edge, you've got the honey storage. So this box, we haven't got as much honey in. So if we brought these boxes into the kitchen now, there would be bees all over the kitchen. It would be a mess. So we need to try and get as many of those bees out of there before we take the honey into the kitchen. And you do this with something called a clearer board. So we've got this board here and we're creating a one-way system for the bees. This little device allows bees to pass through one way but not get back. I'm gonna keep this one box on the hive just in case there's a crazy honey flow over the next few weeks. Then we take our clearer board. Bees can go down, but they can't go up. So this goes on top of here. On top of this board goes our honey boxes. 
all of these bees will try and go down to this area of the hive and then they won't be able to get back up, leaving these boxes hopefully with a lot less bees in. And the roof can now go on. I'm going to leave this maybe 24 hours and see how many of the bees are out of these boxes. Now we've got to do the other hive. There is a lot less honey on that one, but I've still got to take it off. Oh, it's hot lifting all those boxes. This hive did okay this year, just it was nowhere near as strong as that one. So this top box, once again, hasn't got much in. Yeah, so these ones are capped as well. Plenty of honey in here. And there we go. We're gonna come back tomorrow and see if that has worked. Whilst the bees are hopefully being removed from the honey boxes outside, I've got to turn the kitchen into a honey extraction room. So I've got to get a couple of bits of equipment out of storage, set it all up so we have a nice clean working space ready to extract all the honey. This is where I keep all my beekeeping stuff. And here is the extractor, which I've only ever used once, but this will be the second season of honey extracting. So I've got to get that out. This is my manual three frame extractor. So you can put three of those frames in at a time. You spin it and then it sprays the honey to the side. I've got to clean the extractor and all the buckets that I'm gonna use. Oh no. Would you believe it? When I was selling my honey last year, I was a criminal. Apparently, you, you're not allowed to sell honey unless it has a label on it, which states a few different pieces of information. Last year I sold jars of honey to some of my neighbors. I didn't have a label or anything. And um, yeah, I realized you're not allowed to do that. But the process of actually getting my finished label for my honey jars was trickier than I expected. Now you can get generic honey jar labels which you just enter your specific information and get them printed by someone else. They get sent to you and you have your label ready. But I wanted something a little more personal to me and my honey. But it turns out that I know nothing about creating labels. I know nothing about graphic design or anything like that. So I was very lucky to be helped by a couple of very talented people. I met up with an old school friend called Katerina and she is really good at drawing things. We met up last year and she drew this beautiful selection of mushrooms and seeing this made me want to ask her if she could draw something for my honey jar labels as well. On my labels I wanted a picture of some flowers, some blackberry flowers, which are what I think most of my honey is coming from because we have a lot of blackberry flowers around here. And this is what Katerina painted. So thanks to her skills, we now had something to work with. But how was I to get this onto my honey jars? Again, I didn't have a clue. A lady called Barbara from the Czech Republic kindly offered to help me here and is really skilled at graphic design and helped me turn this into a label, which I can show you now. This is my eight ounce, 227 gram honey jar label. You might be wondering why I haven't gone for a sticker design. Instead, I'm just tied on a little uh, tag label with a piece of raffia and that's because I really like the idea of people having my jar of honey and then once they finish the honey they just cut my label off and then they use it for storing other things and you're not left with a sticky label on your jar you're just left with a clear jar uh, like it's brand new and also it means that people who buy the honey can keep this little thing which includes some very important information, like my name and my address. These are uh, legal requirements when you're selling honey. I have to say that it's produce of England and something which isn't necessary. On this page, people can look up me on YouTube or Instagram and find out how this honey was made because on my YouTube channel, I have videos of the whole beekeeping journey. So people can buy the honey, taste it and go, mm, that was nice, wonder how it was made. And then watch a whole film about 
about the whole thing. So that's pretty cool. On the back, I've got some more information like store in a cool, dry place, not suitable for infants under 12 months. I think that is because of the possibility of uh, um, botulis, botulism and also the best before date and batch number. These I've put on the underside because these things might, might change. Like the, the batch number next year will change, uh, but it means I can keep the same tag label. Honey lasts a long, long time. Uh, but you still need to put a best before date. My best before date I've put for two years time. Uh, 18th of September 25, which is my birthday. Um, I thought I'd choose that for the best before date. I'm so excited to fill these up with honey. It's the night before the big day. It feels like the night before Christmas, like when I was a kid. Am I being foolish by prepping three large buckets? Or are we really going to fill them all up? I'm gonna put down some sheets of newspaper on the surface. We hopefully don't get everything too sticky and messy. Cause honey will get everywhere, I reckon. I think we're set, ready for tomorrow. Now I wonder if any of the bees are out from these boxes. If they aren't, then I've got a electric blower. I met up with a beekeeper last year in Sweden and he used a little blower because the clearer boards that I put in, uh, they're not 100% effective. I don't know what percent effective they are actually. We're gonna find out. Are you ready? It wasn't massively effective, it seems. There's definitely less bees in here, but there's still a lot. That box has got no bees in it now. I know it probably looks a bit brutal using the blower to get the bees out, but it doesn't harm the bees. They get blown off the frame and then they just fly off and then come back to the entrance of the hive. So they're all good. Don't worry about them. Oh, this has worked a lot better, this hive. There's only a small cluster here. in the house. I can't imagine being a beekeeper with like a hundred hives. Because your back must really, really hurt after lifting all these boxes. Two more. Well, that was really awkward. Someone was delivering a parcel and uh, I walked to the front door holding this and in my suit. I can imagine they were probably a little bit Worried. There's quite a few bees still in these boxes. And that is this year's crop of honey. I can just hear bees buzzing around the room. The frames of honey are over here. Then they get the cappings cut off into the bucket. The frames then go into the spinner, which we spin. It then goes through the filters and into the bucket. So before we extract the honey, I want to make a guess of, in weight, how much we have. Because last year, we got 12 kilograms from about one and a half supers. It wasn't two completely full supers. I reckon 50 kilograms of honey. That's my estimate, 50 kilograms. Just as a fun little game, we'll be able to see how close I am. Anyway, the first frame. Oh, I can just tell this is gonna be a very sticky day. Honey! This is far from the best looking frame. The tools we're gonna use are a uncapping knife. This is like a serrated bread knife. And an uncapping fork. This is also used to uh, take off the wax cappings. Whoa! And then some bits I missed. But I can get the fork under there and take it off. 
That frame can be put in the extractor. This extractor holds three frames at a time. So I'm going to put two more in. The final frame goes in. I can see the honey spraying out onto the side of the extractor. got to be careful because last year I span this thing way too quick and actually damaged the frames. So I've just turned them around and then I can spin it again. Got honey on my phone. Mm. Oh my goodness. There's a puddle of honey at the bottom and that frame has got no honey in it. I'm going to stop talking and get a move on. And I've got all these boxes to harvest before my parents get home and see the mess that I have created in their kitchen. Ah, there was a bee up my leg. Ow! I got stung. There, there's bees crawling over the floor and climbing up my legs, up my trousers. Ow! So that was the first honey box extracted and that was the least filled one. All those others are a lot heavier. Anyway, there's now enough honey in there to open the valve and start straining it and filtering it through these sieves. So within that honey, you can probably see bits of wax. There'll be large chunks of pollen and all that is gonna be filtered out through this. That is so mesmerizing. So how do bees actually make all this honey? Honey is nectar plus bee enzymes minus some of the water. Nectar is collected by the bees, then brought back to the hive where it is passed around and chewed by the bees, which adds enzymes that break down the complex sugars into simple sugars like glucose and fructose. The bees then have to remove lots of the water so that it won't go bad whilst it's in storage. At this point we can take the honey and be sure that it will last pretty much forever. I read somewhere that honey was found in the pyramids that was thought to be over 3000 years old and it was still edible. Oh wow, that's what you like to see. So full of honey. And this one they've actually built quite a way off the frame. It's like really thick comb. And this is what I've been working towards all season. Well, for the last two years since I started beekeeping. Because it takes a long time to build up an apiary and have colonies which are strong enough to produce a decent amount of honey. And so many times throughout the season, I have thought about giving it all up because you're constantly faced with challenges. There's so many things that are getting in the way and making you think, is this all worth it? Holding these heavy frames thick with honey. The smell and the feel of the comb is, nothing beats it. So was it all worth it? Absolutely, but it certainly doesn't always feel like it is throughout the season. Look at that, thick frame of honey. It's a little bit repetitive after you've done a couple. It's like really satisfying and fun to do the first lot. And then the next lot, I think I just need to put on some music and get through it. Because once you sort of know the process, it's, it's, it's just a bit repetitive. I'm gonna have a little taste. It's honey, sweet, flavorful. I'm really bad at describing flavors. It tastes like honey, and it tastes like very good honey. It's very runny, this honey. I would say it has a very mild taste. It's not like some honeys, which are just super strong. Let's go again. Three boxes in. We have nearly filled up that bucket. And I'm just beginning to extract this super, which I think has got to be the best. We've got, I think, 12 frames, all of them, looking like that. It's taken me three hours to extract one, two, three, three and a half boxes of honey. And we have our first bucket full. Did you know that honey is hydro... hydro... I can't remember what it's called. This is the word, and it means that honey can absorb moisture from the surroundings. 
So I'm gonna put a lid on the bucket because we don't want the moisture level to rise at all because if it does, then it could ferment. Now let's get on with the last three boxes. And we're on to our final box. Now the interesting thing about this last box is that there's less frames in here, but there's the same amount of weight. I think it might be heavier. And that's because I spaced the frames further apart, so the bees draw the comb out further, and so they can store more honey in each comb. So each frame weighs a bit more. It's a shame I only get to do this like one day a year. Maybe in the future I'll have more hives, so I'll be able to do more extracting of honey. Because it's a nice type of work. It's quite repetitive, so you don't have to think much about what you're doing. And you can just put on music and relax whilst you spin out frames of honey. It is a little bit tiring to your arms, lifting the boxes and spinning the extractor constantly. But other than that, it's not too tricky. And that is the honey harvest of 2023 almost done. We have still got to put all of this honey into jars, which might take a while because there's two and a half buckets of it. And then I've got all this wax, the wax cappings, and there's a load of honey in there as well, which I need to put through a sieve to get out the, to separate the wax and the honey. Good day's work. Hello? I got home a bit earlier than expected. I can't remember what you needed from me. I just needed uh, some scales, if you have some. See ya. Bye. Bye. My brother is going to head around now. Uh, he's a fisherman, so he has some um, fishing scales for weighing fish that he catches. And I want to know how much weight of honey I have so that then I can order the right amount of jars to put the honey in. Last year we got 12 and a half kilograms. Oh, yeah, okay, I remember. We got the scales, fish scales for honey. I can't actually lift that with one hand. <laughs> You're gonna need to hook it under and just lift it up. Watch out, because I'm scared that bucket will break. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. There's 26 kilograms in there. Yeah? Yeah. We're gonna be rich! 22 and a half. No, I have a bad back. And do two. So last year we got half of that, and that was everything. Well, you got a lot more bees now, haven't you? Now we got this one. Round and then a lot like three. Ten kilograms. Hey, <laughs> the fish I caught last night was that heavy. And that's just honey. So there's ten kilograms in there. Whoa! There we go. My goodness. You know, I did, an ex I did a guess this morning. Yeah, what did you get? I, get, I wrote it down, 50 kilograms I thought I was gonna and get. what did we get? 68. That's nearly 70 kilograms of honey. <laughs> now I need to work out how many jars I need to buy, and then we can jar it all up. There's, there's gonna be a lot of jars of honey. Good day, I'm gonna get back to work tomorrow. Now something I really want to know is where exactly the bees are collecting the nectar from. Like what species of flowers are they visiting? My guess is that most of the nectar is coming from blackberry and clover flowers, but without lab tests, you really can't be sure. I tried my hand at some microscopy and looked at some different pollen grains under the microscope. It was fascinating to see the different shapes and textures they have, but I was still no closer to finding out what my bees had been foraging on. So instead, I signed up to the National Honey Monitoring Scheme so I could send off some samples of my honey. I kind of gave up trying to identify pollen. It's really tricky. Looking at the pollen underneath a microscope was super interesting and fascinating to see these grains of pollen and the different structures and textures that they have. However, finding out what flowers my bees have visited to create 
this honey is a job better suited for the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. This is the National Honey Monitoring Scheme. I signed up to this a few months ago. It's a scheme which relies on beekeepers sending samples of their honey to them where they can use it for a number of different things. They can uh, find out what flowers bees have been visiting and they can find out what uh, pesticide residues are within the honey. Anyway, today I got sent the sample pack in the post and we're gonna be doing something very scientific. We've got three tubes. One of them is used for plant DNA barcoding. So I think that's uh, analyzing the pollen within the honey and finding out what flowers the pollen is from. Another tube is used just for the National Honey Archive, which I guess they'll just keep for forever and have it as a 2023 honey sample from south of England. And then the last one is to measure pesticide residue. And this is so interesting to me. I really, really want to know what flowers my bees have visited. I, I, I'm desperate to find out because I watch those bees come from the hive, they fly over the fields and then they just disappear. And then they come back and they make this beautiful honey but I don't know where they've actually been. It's a mystery. Anyway, let's take the samples. And there is sample number three. I now have to be patient and wait until the spring of 2024 to find out the results. Just ordered 300 more jars, which came to 158 before postage and 180 after postage. I've now got to put the boxes back on the hives. So these boxes here are gonna go outside, back on the beehives, and the bees will go and clean up all of the mess, because currently these are all very wet. Every frame has got loads of drippings of honey on it, but the bees will clean this all up for me, and then I can put these boxes into storage uh, for the winter. My 300 jars arrived in the post, one more box and it's time to start putting all my honey which is currently in buckets into these jars i quite like the hexagonal jars they're nice to hold they look quite good so this bucket is gonna go up here and this has a valve on the front which i can open to fill up the jars let's go for it first jar whoa the most satisfying thing to watch in the world. Now I got to do a quick turnaround where it goes from one to the next without spilling too much honey on the floor. Now I tested the water content of this honey the other day with a refractometer. Refractometer? Refractometer. I'm not too sure what it's called. Anyway, it tells you how much water is in the honey and it's 18%. So that means it is under the 20% which it needs to be for legally selling as honey. Time to put the lids on. First jar of my honey with the lid on. I just need to label them. I'm happy about that. The bucket is getting empty, so I need to fill it up with this bucket. And here is my honey harvest, all in jars. I have filled up 233 eight ounce jars. There's still probably a few jars worth inside this bucket and the other buckets, but they're right at the bottom and they're hard to get out. Also, the last amount of honey often has the uh, lots of bubbles in and lots of like the foam that comes to the surface. So I'm gonna keep that for myself. I'm very happy about all this honey and I suppose I've got to try and get rid of it. But first we've got to attach all the labels. Whoa, that's gonna take some time because I'm gonna to have to tie each label on to the jars. I'm gonna do that tomorrow, I think. 
after harvesting all the honey, I'm left with this whole bucket full of wax. And what I'm going to do is melt it down over a bain-marie, which I'm heating up on the stove there, and filter it through a pillowcase. Then I can try making some candles, because candles are lovely. Let's pour this into the pan. So all this wax came from either the cappings from the honey that I took off the other day, or just from bits of comb that I've taken off the hives throughout the year. And some of this is actually from last year, because I didn't really have enough last year to make candles. Right, let's melt that down. So the way this bain-marie works is that I filled up a little outer section with some water. So there's water protecting the wax from the heat because you don't want the wax to get too hot, otherwise it will set fire. And I learned that one of the best ways to filter wax is for a old pillowcase. So I'm going to put this inside a bucket, pour all the wax in there, and then it will drain through. It's almost all melted now. I'm gonna start pouring some through the filter. My very improvised wax dripping setup. Just getting the final bits of wax into the bucket. If you want to ruin your parents' kitchen surfaces, try making candles. You get so little wax for the amount of honey. Right, I've just washed all the honey off the wax, and there we go. There is a small wheel of wax, a bit like a wheel of cheese. So now we need to melt this down again so then we can pour it into the molds. Just got my honey labels printed properly, 25 pounds for 300 of them. It's another cost, but at least they look nice with proper paper and proper cutting. And what I have to do with all of these is fold them in half, make a hole in the corner, and then I can tie these to the tops of the labels. But first we're gonna go through all the jars and put a second label underneath because it's a legal requirement to have the use by date and lot number. And on this label gun that I bought, we got a use by date. Annoyingly, the underside of the honey jar isn't as flat or as smooth as my cheek. Press the trigger of the gun and then it doesn't actually go on so I have to actually take the label off manually which defeats the object of having it as a gun and then sticking it down without ruining all the ink. So the way I'm going to do this is by taking a piece of raffia and pushing it through the hole in the label. I tie round the jar, so I could have used a lot shorter length of raffia. I overdid it that time. And then do another knot to secure it. And then cut the tag ends. We have a jar of honey ready to sell. And I'm so pleased about this because people can use their honey and then they can take off the label. They can keep it if they want, or they can burn it or throw it away. And then they have a jar which they can use for anything they want. There we go. There's a jar of honey. Better get a move on. I only got 250 more to do. And we're gonna cut to when we've done all of them because it would be incredibly boring to watch me do it real time. My mum just showed me a better way to do it. And now they look like that. We're now attaching them slightly differently at the top. Looks a bit neater. Whoa, that was some repetitive work. But we have got, oh, I wish I could say that all of them labeled. This is only half of them, not even half actually, but we've got some finished products ready to sell. There we go, eight ounce jar of honey with a label on. Oh, it looks so good. I've been getting lots of messages from people over the past couple of months, 
people have been asking, how can I buy your honey? And however much I would love to be able to sell some honey to the people who have watched these videos, I don't really think I have enough here to set up an online store and distribute around the world. And also I realized that every one of you will have a local beekeeper, someone who has worked incredibly hard to get a harvest of honey. They will be trying to sell that honey too. Uh, you don't need my stuff. Uh, your local beekeeper will have honey which tastes just as good as this. I would definitely say go and support them. The way I'm going to sell this honey is in an honesty box outside my house. Uh, I'm going to sell to the local people who live around this area. Uh, quite a few people go walking down the road outside, so hopefully people will stop by and buy a jar. They're going to be £5 a jar. If I can sell all this honey, I might actually be able to help pay for the cost of the beekeeping. I'll do a breakdown later of how much I spent on the beekeeping and how much I earn back. Anyway, let's sell this stuff. Let's try and sell it. Does anyone want any honey near me? Alex's farm shop open for business. Let's hope some of it sells. We've got some silicon molds. These were actually very expensive, like 30 pounds each. And then I've got a couple of different sizes of wick. Wick is important. Uh, the wick size is important, apparently. So I've got thicker wick for the thick candle, thinner wick for the thin candle. And then I've got a wick holder, which holds the wick in place, central. First, I need to poke the wick into the bottom of the candle. There we go, pulled the wick out. Take a piece of blue tack, fill the hole. So the wick is coming up central. That is one candle ready to fill. My first candle pouring ever. And now we have to wait for ages. I think two hours we have to wait it all to set. I've waited about an hour and I'm gonna see if my candle is ready to take out of the mold. I th it feels like it. Wow, I made a candle. On the underneath, I need to chop off the wick. <laughs> hey, we got a candle. Let's see if it works. Imagine if it doesn't work. That's cool. It's actually quite easy. It doesn't require much skill. You just pour molten wax into a mold. This one is thin. Ta-da! I made some candles as well as the honey. Oh my goodness, it's actually selling. Look at that, we had 10 out here yesterday. Money. That's if people are being honest. Oh yeah, nice. However, I spent so much more than £10 on beekeeping this year, so I need to sell an awful lot more of these. Business is good at the moment. The honey that I put out the front of the house is selling well. A few of the neighbours have stopped by and put some money in the box and bought some honey, which is great. Uh, and I've also been selling to some local people through Instagram. So I put a post up the other day saying if there's anyone local, come and collect it. Someone who bought some honey this morning actually gave me some eggs. It's been a great day of selling honey and it's been so nice to meet up with the people who have been buying it. And just now I met up with a family who gave me a card. They wrote, to Alex, thanks for making such interesting and enjoyable videos. We love watching them and have learned a lot from you. Oh, so, so amazing. I never would have thought that my silly little YouTube videos could uh, teach people something or give people entertainment. So I really, I really appreciate that. Anyway, I've still got plenty of honey to sell, so we're gonna keep going. I've got a little tray with some honey and I need to deliver to someone locally.
delivery done. This is amazing. A baker called Anna came and she brought a load of cookies. Oh, wow. One of the best cookies I've ever had. Wow. Hey! These people have come from. Where have you come from? <laughs> Melton Keynes, buddy. <laughs> Melton Keynes to come and get some honey. So I'm showing them the bees in the garden. Because it's too far to come just to pick up some jars and go home. <laughs> Dominic, who just visited, gave me some of his homegrown carrots. Hey! James has come from Portsmouth? Yes, Portsmouth. Yeah. Where? Some honey. We did a swap. So you've got some of my honey, and I've got some Portsmouth honey. Mine's quite light. Yeah, yours is really light. Mine's definitely darker. Well, thank you. No worries, awesome. So these guys have just come from London and you come on your bikes. Thanks for coming down, guys. No worries. <laughs> have a good journey back to London. <laughs> we'll see ya. They cycled from London to come and pick up the honey. It's amazing all the different people I get to meet doing this. The past week since I harvested the honey has been really quite busy. I've been trying to sell as much of my honey as possible because it was taking up loads of space in the kitchen and my parents wanted me to get rid of it so it wasn't all over the house. And I think we've done a pretty good job. I've sold and given away almost all the jars of honey. And I've also received some really nice gifts from the people who have come to collect the honey. I got given this bee made from a paper plate. We got a jar of apple, pear and ginger jam, which I had on my toast yesterday and it was so good. The other day, a lady came around and gave me this. She does really nice prints. Uh, she has an Instagram uh, page, painting in scrubs. So you can check that out. But yeah, look at that, a bee print. Then this morning I got a couple more gifts got some honey from a beekeeper. We actually traded honey. So I got a jar of his stuff. I gave him one of my jars. And then just now I got given this Bakewell pie, a very interesting range of gifts. I got a total of 11 and a half candles. I say half because this one, this is the size they're meant to be, but then I had some wax left over, which meant my last one was this size. Anyway, I'm really happy with them actually. Uh, I could definitely do a slightly better job with cleaning the wax, there are some bits of dirt in there, so maybe I need to do a better job of filtering. But I have some beautiful candles, and these beeswax candles, they burn such a long time compared to other candles, that they last for ages. Pure 100% beeswax. I would love to try and uh, sell candles along with my honey, maybe next year, but you just get so little wax for the amount of Honey. I've got probably enough candles to last me the winter. They're so beautiful. I really like them. And they smell just incredible. Like unbelievably good. I've had this one going by the side of my bed the last few days. A few days after putting the wet honey frames, honey supers, back on the hives, the bees have cleaned them all up. Like the bees are excellent cleaners. And these are all completely dry. They were really sticky and they would have been a nightmare to try and store over winter. But now these are completely dry, nice and lightweight because all the honey has been taken out of them. And now I need to do a couple of things. There's a pest called a wax moth, which is actually a very helpful animal because it helps clean old wax up. It's like a recycler of wax. Um, but as a beekeeper, you don't want the wax moth to destroy your nice frames, which the bees have worked so hard making. And the way you kill off everything is by freezing it. Now I would love to have a massive chest freezer, which I can just dump all of this in, straight in, then take it out and then store it. However, I've only got one drawer of space to use in this freezer, so it's gonna take a while to clean it all. But if I don't do this, then the wax moth will probably destroy all my comb. There we go. I must have 80 frames to do. So this is gonna take a while. It's gotta be done.
865 pounds is the total income from my honey that I've sold. I had a total of 233 jars of honey, of which I sold 173 of them. The other 60 I gave away to friends and family. It might look like a lot of cash, and it is. This is the most amount of money I've seen, I think, ever in paper notes. But before I get too excited and think that I'm rich, we've got to look at how much money I actually put into this project. You can't just look at the income, you have to look at all the money that you spent. Now I look back through my receipts over the past year and I've added together all the costs. This list of outgoings includes new hives that I had to buy, uh, queen bees that I bought halfway through the season, treatment that I treated the bees with last winter, the jars that all the honey went into and lots of other little bits and pieces that I had to buy along the way. The total amount of money that I've spent on beekeeping over the past year is £1,725, which makes the figure of £865 not so impressive because now we can see that uh, my beekeeping project has made a loss of £887, which makes it sound like beekeeping is a project where you're just throwing money away. But a lot of the outgoings this year have been things which can be used again. They are valuable pieces of kit which will help me earn money in the future, such as the beehives. The beehives will be able to be used for many years into the future. There's other things which are consumables which I have to buy every year, like the jars that I put the honey in and the labels, and also sugar if I want to feed the bees throughout the winter. You know, that stuff runs out. And I'm pretty certain that if I decide next year not to invest loads more money in, basically buy loads more highs, and I just keep my apiary the size that it is, I should be able to make a profit. That's the plan anyway. And this next season of beekeeping is going to be full of a load more challenges because I'm actually going to be moving house very soon. I think in three weeks I'm moving to the city of Bristol and the bees are coming with me. So stay tuned, uh, subscribe to see the journey continue as I try my best to move house with my bees. We're gonna load them up in my van, I think, and and drive them halfway across the country. Anyway, thanks so much for watching this beekeeping episode. Thanks for watching this whole series. Uh, uh, this series has been going on for two years now. I can't believe it's still going. And we're gonna continue. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon.